So far in this series of films, I have discussed the ball game as a way of encountering and developing the mechanics of the self, and as a domain of metaphor about performance through which performers can model appropriate ways of thinking. This film looks at the principles that underpin the ball game. I often refer to my entire approach to training as being principle based. What does this mean? A principle guides a performer towards finding an appropriate perspective towards a way of looking at things and reacting to them that will serve her development. Eugenio Barber describes principles as particularly good bits of advice. I think of them as the foundational attitudes, the very texture of the way each member of the ensemble approaches their personal work and their interactions with others. If we see ethics as the rules that govern behaviour, then we could even describe foundational principles as the ethical basis of the training. I think of an ensemble as a group of unique individuals who share an ethical foundation through shared principle. A principle needs to be a simple idea or attitude which holds true across the entire spectrum of the training. It's important to note that the principle need not hold true outside of the training. Its function is to underpin the shared work in the studio and any applicability it has beyond that is for each individual to negotiate for him or herself. For example, I have already discussed the principle, don't be helpful. I'm not suggesting that as a principle it should necessarily govern one's behaviour outside the studio. In this film I'm going to look in some more detail at two of the principles that underpin my work. Have no opinion and if there's nothing for you to do, do nothing. Both of these are simply stated, a little simplistic even. This is quite deliberate. The first function for any principle is that it be easily available to the performer to draw on while she is engaged in the complex, real-time process of paying attention to impulse and reaction. It is no use if it is not easily brought to mind and obviously applicable. Hence the simplicity. When I suggest that if there is nothing for one to do, one should do nothing, I am drawing the performer's attention to a number of key elements of ensemble performance. First, I am noting that sometimes one's task is to wait until there's something to do. In other words, I'm saying that knowing when to allow the focus to be elsewhere is a core discipline of ensemble. Secondly, I am suggesting that the act of doing nothing is an active choice, that waiting and switching off are not the same thing. To do nothing actively and attentively is a necessary part of any performance score during which one awaits the impulse that will generate the next part of activity. Thirdly, I'm giving the performer permission to trust her instinct about when there is nothing needful to do, rather than encouraging her to feel somehow that she is not contributing if she's not actively doing things. We've all seen performances, especially improvisations, when performers are all doing far too much. Sometimes the most useful contribution one can make is to do nothing. Of course, doing nothing includes not distracting oneself with unnecessary thinking. So, this principle, explored in the ball game but transferable to all training, rehearsal and performance contexts, encourages performers to find appropriate levels of activity within the unfolding of the ensemble action, so that each performer does everything the task requires of her and nothing the task does not require of her. The principle, have no opinion, though easy to state, can be profoundly disorientating for a performer. How can it be useful not to have an opinion? For many of us, our entire worldview is based on having opinions. Doesn't lack of opinion lead to complacency, which is precisely not the attitude that will have caused someone to seek out training? Nonetheless, it is a fundamental principle, though it requires careful development during the process of training. I usually introduce it through encouraging people in the ballgame not to worry, telling them you can't get anything wrong. 
This already is a challenge for some people who enter training wanting to succeed, who, assuming that catching is a success and dropping a failure, place all their attention on catching the bag, often at the expense of allowing the energy to flow. Much training and education and much social pressure tries to divide actions into success and failure. So even the idea that one can get nothing wrong can be a significant challenge. However, once that idea is embedded into the training, I might introduce the idea that just as there is no such thing as wrong, so there is no such thing as right. All that there is, is the doing of the task. This works for a while, but still people tend to feel, reasonably enough, that it is better to catch than to drop, for it makes a flow of energy via the ball smoother. There is a spectrum of possible responses. Sometimes not catching the ball is the more appropriate response if by doing so the performer manages to deal with two other balls. It all depends on the context and how each specific action fits into the hierarchy of tasks. The binary right-wrong approach is not useful in finding the appropriate reaction to each impulse. Thus, the principle might develop to become Though there is neither right nor wrong in the moment that an action happens, there are more and less appropriate responses which later one might want to reflect on. The problem with this as a principle is that it is hardly easily memorable. Therefore, it is not something the performer can draw on in the heat of the ball game. So, the principle undergoes another development. Have no opinion. At this point, the principle really starts to talk to its foundational function. Namely, it encourages the performer to keep her work live. The principle emphasises that at the moment anything happens within an exercise or a performance, it is the performer's job to work with the reality of that action, to respond appropriately, and that having an opinion about how things ought to have been will simply get in the way of that appropriate reaction. To be alive, one must be in contact with and responding to absolute reality. Opinions do not and cannot help. So, this principle, carefully developed during a training process, can lead the ensemble to a place of paying rigorous attention to the reality of the flow of impulse to reaction, to working openly and non-judgmentally with others, and to allowing each individual ensemble member to make a full and idiosyncratic contribution to the overall texture of the ensemble. As such, it speaks to the ethics of interaction as a foundation for the existence of the ensemble. Principles are the foundation of the ensemble. They need to be rigorous, yet flexible, simple, yet sophisticated. If they are, they can serve as a guide for governing the choices each individual makes in how she interacts with others in the ensemble and how she treats herself as she undergoes a process of growth and development. They can underpin healthy and effective relationships of self with self and self with others.